Today's the fourth, uh, the final Sunday of Advent. Uh, next Sunday need will be Christmas Sunday, the, the first Sunday after Advent where we can really rejoice that, that finally Christ is here. But these past four weeks, we have been preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ. We began with the second return of Christ, the, the second coming of Christ. We talked about that, that, and then we talked about the ways that Christ's way was prepared for his first arrival through John the Baptist, through the uh, announcement to Mary by Gabriel last week, and then here, finally, how has Mary responded? Our, our passage here today might be a familiar one. It is Mary's song, or the Magnificat, one of the truly the, the greatest songs of Scripture, of Mary the Virgin rejoicing in what God has done for her. She was just met with Elizabeth, her relative, who was also uh, pregnant with John the Baptist, and they meet together, and, and John the Baptist in the womb leaps for joy, leaps for the Spirit, because he is in the presence of his Savior in the womb of Mary. Mary is starting to click these things into place to understand that, that she's not pregnant with any mere child, but with the Savior of the world, and hear this song as we eagerly are awaiting and expecting for Christmas morning, the arrival of Jesus. Hear the shout of joy that Mary has for what God has done. Follow along with me um, on the words of the screen or in your copy of the scriptures. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown a strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. In the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. Christmas is a, is a time of great hope. It's a time of great joy, Right? But it's also, interestingly enough, Christmas is a season of, of paradox, of things that you would not expect to be together, to be held in the same hand, yet somehow fit together, that almost seem like opposites, that cannot exist together. It's a season of light, right? In the darkest times of the year, perhaps that's why we need the lights of Christmas, the candles in the window, the lights on trees inside, because it is indeed for us in this hemisphere, such a dark time of the year, season of warmth and good cheer in what often can be one of the coldest times of the year, although I'm not complaining about the mild weather we're having today, but I think all of those strange things that don't seem to fit together, that are trying to kind of fight against one another, alludes to a, a greater paradox, a greater mystery that's really hard to understand. A miraculous virgin conception that we talked about last week. God, the, the creator of the universe, becoming man and coming to earth. Jesus, fully God and fully man. How does that fit together? I'm starting to understand that these things are even harder to understand than just warmth and good cheer in a cold, depressing time of the year. One paradox that I think we might not think about this time of year, but what you might be thinking about throughout the year is one that people throughout all time have wrestled with, of can God exist, a truly merciful, a truly loving God, and also be all-powerful? Can God be mighty and merciful to you, or is he just one and not the other? That is something people have often wrestled with and often used to disprove that even God exists because there is evil in the world. Is God not loving enough to stop it? 
but strong enough to stop it, but chooses not to? Or is God merciful in trying to counteract the evil, but he's not strong enough, not mighty enough to stop it? It has troubled many people, prevented people from believing in God. Or if they do believe in a God, they believe in a weak God or a hateful God, which I posit to you, a God that is not both merciful and mighty is not the God of Scripture. This is the paradox that's hard for us to understand, isn't it? Perhaps you look at your life and in this past year and you felt like you received a great deal of mercy, but not a lot of might and control in your life. Or you've only received pain and struggle. And you feel like, God, will you just let up for a minute and give me some mercy? Maybe that's the God you have seen in this life. How are we to understand that somehow God is both fully merciful and fully mighty? Well, it's something that Mary is able to actually hold together. Mary's understand it, able to understand it. Why can this young woman understand something that has troubled so many philosophers throughout all time? How can Mary understand something that seems so far from maybe some of you? Well, it's because the answer to how God can be both fully merciful and fully mighty, fully strong and fully loving. The answer to that, the way we can hold both those things at once, is within her womb at the moment. The answer to God's might and his mercy is Jesus in her womb. She fully understands God is able, he is willing to be merciful, and he is mighty enough to bring it about. So we're going to look at his mercy and his might, but why, and then thirdly, why it even matters for us is because God will remember and consider you as well. His mercy, his might, and his remembrance for us. This is what the song of Mary, this Magnificat, shows us, teaches us, as it were. First of all, Mary considers the mercy of God. It begins with her saying, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. I mean, that's it right there. He is, he is mighty, and he has done great things for me. He's mighty, and he's merciful. But who, what kind of people does God show mercy to? And I think this is the, the beautiful part, the way you really know it's mercy and not just favoritism or preference, but true, mysterious mercy is that he shows his mercy to the humble. She says a few times, the humble estate. The humble estate of your servant, he, she says. She's considering herself in that, lo- in that role. Someone who's humble. We talked last week about how impossible someone like Mary would be favored. This poor woman, betrothed to be married, but not married yet, of no true high position in a poor city. In the hierarchy of her day, she would see herself as less value, less valuable, less honor, less favored, less love than others, less deserving. That's her situation. That's her state. Who am I? To receive anything from God, she may wonder. And maybe that's something you've asked yourself as well, feeling like no one looks out for you. But someone is looking on her. Someone has looked upon her. Yahweh has looked upon her, and not only just looked upon her and exalted her, but he has exalted her. He's lifted her up, shot her all the way up to the top of this hierarchy, right? Flipped it all the way around. He's shown mercy not only to the humble, she refers to herself as a servant. She refers also her your servant Israel, the whole nation of God's people. And and servant is too soft of language for us. In Greek, they've got one word for servant and slave. It's, It's the same kind of word. It's not like this cute little upstairs, downstairs relationship you see like in Downton Abbey of like the owners of the house and the servants. No, it's we're talking about master-slave. We're talking about the, different, the difference between a king and a serf. We're talking about the, the difference between an emperor and an untouchable beggar. That is the space between God and a sin, sinner like you and I. But God looks upon his servant and shows love. He looks upon this lowly person and remembers her. And he 
cares for her. You want to understand what mercy looks like? The surprise, the the shock of mercy? That's it right there. That he would consider someone like Mary, that he would consider someone like you, someone like me. God shows his mercy to those who fear him. And, and that, though, that mercy to those who fear him goes on from generation to generation. Generation to generation goes on and on. It's not just a story that is, oh, wow, he remembered Mary and he cared for Mary alone. It doesn't stop with her, it begins with her. And that's how it connects to you as well. Generations down from her, even to you, it follows through time. It's not just simply Mary's story. It's the beginning of a story that is yours as well. Of showing mercy to the hungry. That's the next one. He shows mercy to the hungry. Verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. We're going to look at that kind of reversal happening in the next point as well. But let's kind of prepare ourselves thinking about that. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Not only is the the mercy to those who are hungry, but it is a reversal of those you would expect to be fed and filled up. I mean, think of a a brand new five-star restaurant, and the richest people in the city are lined up out the door hoping to get a table because they hear of how world-famous this chef is, and he's opening a new restaurant. They want to be the first ones in there to review it, to eat it, to show their status of just even being able to attend this restaurant. And yet, what if only those who are without a home, without money, without shelter, without food, what if only they were brought in, given a chair, and given a menu? Anything they wanted from it, no charge. And the head chef then goes out to the, all the high-class, elite people of the city who lined up around the block and says, sorry, we're full, we cannot serve you tonight. Just, you know, there's a pizza place across the street, you can go there. This is what God, Mary sees God doing. This thing that is so sh- surprising, almost feels like a publicity stunt. It is that noticeable. It's not a stunt for God. It's who he is. It's his character of mercy to those who would be forgotten, of reversing the way that we value things. I think the reversal that God is doing here is important for us to see. And also for us to consider who we show our mercy to as well. I mean, who cares for the servant in this way? A patient doesn't care for a doctor. Master of the house doesn't cook for the butler. But yet God cares and shows mercy to you, his servant. Someone lowly, someone far. And it is not us trying to make ourselves good enough to come to him. It is not us trying to work our way up the ladder so we can get closer to God. It is God who has come down to us in Christ. He's condescended. He's come down to care for, to show his mercy, to help you. That is the promise that Mary sees and understands in her womb. But I I want you to understand that this, this beautiful picture of mercy means nothing if God is not mighty enough to make it happen. That, that mercy is just, it's just good, heartfelt things, but it doesn't mean anything if God's not mighty enough to actually make it happen and accomplish it. That's why uh, filled in this song of mercy is also this theme of might and strength. He has shown his strength with his arm. He scouted the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. You know, being uh, exalted from your humble, your low estate only matters if he's made some room for you up at the top. Remove the mighty from their thrones those who were there before. It only matters if God has power over the most powerful. God, for him to be able to upend and reverse things, means he is above and reigning over all things. This great reversal, this great exchange of the powerful being deposed and the lowly being lifted up, throughout time, do you realize how much 
So many societies, our society, long for this kind of thing of giving to the poor and taking away from the rich. I mean, that goes from Robin Hood to any revolutionary, right? Wanting to see that full reversal of things. But how terrifyingly quick when we as humans attempt this kind of reversal can turn to tyranny as well. To permanently bring things into harmony it just doesn't last long when we really try to make these reversals happen. Only Christ can truly, truly keep things in harmony by his reversal. Reversing powers of harm and oppression by blood and warfare is what I think so often humans try to do, and it becomes a live by the sword, die by the sword, and it cannot stay for long. We cannot fix the problems of this world by just simply out with the old and with the new. We need true transformation. We need recreation. And only God is mighty enough to truly accomplish that. And, and how do we know that is even possible? Not only is God mighty enough to do that kind of reversal, Jesus himself underwent that reversal. Who had a quality of with God, but not consider it something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of what a servant, as Philippians 2 tells us. Jesus, by coming into the womb of Mary, has underwent that reversal himself, leaving his throne in heaven to come down to this earth in the humble estate of a servant. How do we know that this reversal is possible? How do we know that God is mighty enough to do it? Because he underwent it himself so that you would have a place in heaven under God's throne. Jesus came to earth, humbled himself so you would be exalted, so you would be lifted up. And yes, now Jesus doesn't give up that throne forever. He rises again from the dead. He ascends to the throne where he sits now. He is enthroned now. And why that is good news for you that Christ is enthroned now is because you're exalted by him doing that. That he reigns now. He is in control now. That he is mighty now over the problems of your life and of this world. Not only did he come to earth to show you his mercy to you, but he ascended to heaven that he might reign and be in control. She rejoices because she knows her God rules the world. And the baby she's about to deliver is the promised king who will establish his kingdom. For all the hardship and present difficulty she has under the Roman rule, she is rejoicing. She's bearing the ruler of the universe, greater than any Caesar or king or Herod she has ever heard of. And as citizens, as everyday people, we might often fear and worry about our human rulers. Even a democratic country like America, we can feel intense worry, anxiety, frustration in this coming election year. I've already seen the apathy in so many people looking ahead of, really, we're just going to get more of this. And we grumble and complain and attack those we don't agree with hoping for our party to be the ones placed in rule. And if we lose, we throw our hands up at the sky. And if the people we like win, we act as if now we've arrived. Now the true victory should happen. But we often try to make those kinds of warfares were by fear and by attack. And I think as Christians, we should stand up for what is right, for, for ju justice, for the defense of the lives of the unborn, the sojourner, the poor. And it doesn't seem like either party does that together. Let us not forget that we are overall not serving one party. We serve Christ who rules over all, who puts those in power who's able to reverse things and exalt the humble. Let us rejoice then for the ruler that we do have, already enthroned. It doesn't take a show of hands or a vote. 
but is there forever. So in this next year, maybe even this week, as the, the news worries us, makes us anxious, which it's by design going to do, remember the ruler that we do have, that he is mighty, that he is reigning and is greater than anyone else. But not only that, he is merciful and mighty. Again, his mercy only matters if he's mighty enough to bring it. And his might is only good news for you if he brings his might with mercy. But also, this is not just the, the final piece of good news here that Mary just softly mentions. But the best news for you and me is that this is not just good news for Mary. But his remembrance means he's remembering his people. He's remembering his mercy for his people. This is not just for Mary and the good news that she has. But it's for all of us. She says that he has helped his servants, his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. God does not forget his promises. Remembrance of his mercy he spoke to his fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring forever. Remembrance here is not God saying, whoops, I forgot an appointment or an obligation. It is him holding to his covenant promise. It means that when God makes a promise, he will remember it. That's the only thing he can do about it. He will do it. It's not like someone forgetting or forgetting to the last minute. Like maybe some of you realizing you might have some gifts that you still have to wrap up. He's reaffirming what has already been said. And it's beautiful what, what insight Mary sees this with. That she understands what is happening here goes all the way back to Abraham. Why? What's the connection to Abraham and his offspring? She understands that God is God of covenant promises. That God promised Abraham through you the whole world will be blessed. And the blessing to the whole world is through Jesus. It's why tomorrow we sing joy to the world. Not just to Mary, not just to the Jews or to Israel, but to the whole world because the blessings of the whole world comes through Christ. The fulfillment of God's covenant promise is remembered and confirmed in the child in Mary's womb. When you read about Abraham, know that he is promising not only simply Isaac, but the full, true fulfillment of that promise of the child to Abraham is Jesus. Of God saying, I will remember my people. I will remember my promises. And even as Mary stands almost 2,000 years away from Abraham, and you stay, stand 2,000 years away from Mary, she sees that promise just as present to Abraham as it is to her. And you can see that promise fulfilled to Mary just as near as she sees Abraham to her. That promise seems to almost fold time and space together. God's coming to promises fold time and space together so that we can see Mary and Abraham. And Jesus can say, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. God remembering his promise means he is looking upon you, his humble servant. And looking upon you with might to exalt you. This is why all of this even matters in the first place. Because the promise of Jesus is not just to Mary or to Joseph, but to you today now. It's not like watching someone else open up a gift that is really important to them and you just watch on vicariously. It is for you. Take it in faith and hold to it dearly. That's why we can rejoice with Mary. Magnify the Lord. Magnify him for what he has done along with her. She is honoring and exalting God because that is what he has done for her. So magnify God with Mary today. Because you will, I promise, continually be frustrated by the humble estate of your life. The parts of life that are already have been frustrated by the fall and are going to continue to be frustrated in your life in the next year. The humiliation that sin brings into your home, into your work. Forgetting things, not understanding what you're supposed to do. Shame of not proving yourself, but instead seeming like you're only proving your weaknesses. 
the constant frustration and raising children that are not always as perfect as you really would hope and desire. And you're not always as patient with those you are to care for and love as you would desire. Even in those situations where our family, our home, our future, our work, our careers are continuously frustrated by the sinfulness of this world, that things are not as they ought to be, God is merciful to you. He is mighty and he reigns even over the world of your work and your life. And he remembers and he considers you. His word is for you. So when you don't feel the the strength or the knowledge or the time or the physical might to accomplish what is before you today or tomorrow or this week, when it's all so overwhelming, when you feel like those above you are so much more powerful and controlled, God is still mightier even than they are. When you feel kept in your place, facing negative evaluation, constantly humbled or brought low to a humble estate, they don't really have that kind of say in, over you to say who you are. Know what Christ has said you are, exalted, lifted up. You are fed. You are remembered. I have looked upon you and I have seen you. I know you. You are exalted in Christ. That is what God says to you. So go rejoice. Look over this past year and see how God has been still reigning and mighty in your life. See how God has been merciful in your life. See how God has not forgotten you throughout your life. And look expectantly ahead to 2024 and how we will continue to do that talked at the beginning about these paradoxes, right? These things that just do not seem to fit together, and how can they work together? Sometimes the answer to how we make these impossible things fit together is just right under our nose this whole time. There, I still, day-to-day, you know, log on to Wordle really quick and do a couple. I've, I have, like, two opening an- guesses I do every time, and I can usually guess it in three to four. It, like, goes really quick. That sounds like a brag, but I'll tell you that twice this week, I like got down to the last one and almost struck out for the most ridiculous reason. I kept forgetting that B is a letter in our, our alphabet. Like, like both times I was leaving out the letter B and I needed it. And one of them was like for the word table. And I was guessing every, I had all the other letters and I had a guess of where they were. And for some reason, I like was guessing table uh, with a T, with a B, P, and forgot that B exists. Like that kind of ridiculous kind of stuff. Another time on built. Uh, Guilt. Maybe that says something about me that I guess guilt before built, right? But the answer is right there, sitting right there. I couldn't understand how these things fit together and made sense of what I was looking at. It was right there. And you might be looking at something right now of the way God has been working in your life and be like, God, how can you possibly be mighty enough to fix my life or merciful enough to care? How do you even consider me? The answer is right under your nose. The answer that to God's mercy and might fitting together is right for you there in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The proof of God's mercy and might is that your hope is that your hope is an everlasting hope. The proof of God's mercy and might is that He can accomplish it. He has accomplished it in Jesus Christ. And your life can be a living testament in extending that mercy to the lowly, using the strength that you have. But your mercy and strength is not going to be able to undo and reverse all the great evils in this world. Your hope is in the small acts of mercy and might outflowing from your magnifying of Christ, outflowing of your rejoicing. That when you praise God and live for him and what Christ has done in you and through you, your life is just God's mercy and might under a microscope. It is like a microscopic version of the full grandeur of God's mercy and might. It is God's mercy and his might truly magnified in your life. So today, the rest of our time of worship today, let us magnify God's mercy, magnify his might, and remember how he has remembered us. Let's pray.